If you have your Bibles, please turn to Acts chapter 19. It's on page 744 if you have one of our free Bibles. Um, if you don't have a free Bible, please pick one up. We'd love to give it to you. Get it in your hands. Uh, we're going to continue with Paul's third missionary journey. And I titled this sermon, An Encounter with the Gospel, because when people begin to see other people live out Christianity vibrantly, authentically, genuinely, it shakes the kingdom of darkness. See, you can't behave your modify to be a Christian. That only lasts so long. But if you are walking with Jesus and we're living lives of daily repentance and we're growing with him, it shakes the kingdom of darkness because your testimony and what you say and how you live goes far beyond what you ever think. We're going to see that here when the gospel and the lives of people that are changed come to Demetrius, a silversmith, a worker of metal, and he creates idols for the Ephesian goddess Artemis or Diana, if you're reading from the KJV. Uh, he sees it, he hears it, and it's echoing across Ephesus because people are not changing temporarily. They're laying everything on the line for Jesus. We read last week, they're burning all their magical books, the witchcraft, and the money that accounted for there is either on the low end, $35,000, or on the high end, it's $4.8 million that they burn to let people know their lives are changed. But it doesn't stop there. We're going to take a look at Paul as he's slowing down, that he mentors people. We're going to see that this gospel confronts people, and you have an option to slow down and assess where you're at with Jesus and say, Lord, maybe I got to do some changing in my life. All of us need that. Amen. I'll say it. Amen. I need that. Or you can dismiss it and pretend like it's not there and you're going to defend the lie that you're living, the destructive habits that you're living, and you're going to further the destructive pattern. So we're going to walk through uh, Acts chapter 19, starting at verse 21. Now, after these things were finished, what things? the extraordinary miracles that the previous verses record. Remember that? God was doing wondrous things, extra or establishing the apostolic ministry of Paul. He was doing extraordinary miracles, and all this is taking place. Paul resolved in the spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Here's something that we need to learn, and it'd be very wise for us to always keep in mind. Paul... When he is growing with the Lord, this is his third missionary journey, we see him slow down quite a bit. But not only that, we see that he resolves in the Spirit. What does that even mean? It means that Paul made the decision to rest easy in the arms of God, to turn over his will, to turn over his desires, to turn over everything. So in other words, when Paul is growing with Christ, he makes the decision. To say, today, I'm going to be resolved. I'm going to give my life over to Jesus today and tomorrow. Not in a salvific sense. He's already saved. But every time that he moves, he's making it a point. I'm going to commit my dreams, my desires, my goals, my hopes, all my future aspirations. I'm going to surrender and resolve it to the Spirit because I know the Lord is going to take care of me. What would it look like if the church today in America, I don't know about other countries, but I know about America, if we woke up every day to say, Lord, I want to be resolved to be in your spirit today. Lord, today, where are you working at? Where are you working at? Because I want to be there. And I'm an introvert, so I don't like talking to people. But Lord, if you want me to talk to people, I'll talk to people. I want to be resolved. I want to have the maturity of Paul to be like, you know what? When I wake up, I want to surrender all things to Jesus. Not just a little bit. Sometimes we walk in this world and say, like, well, yeah, I'm a believer in Christ and, and I, I gave Jesus a little bit of this over here, but you didn't give him everything. You didn't give him everything. You're still holding on to the sin. You're still holding on to the struggle. You're still holding on to things that you think that you can control. But the fact of the matter is you do not have the strength spiritually to break free from that. You got to surrender it to Jesus. You got to be resolved in the spirit to say, you know what? Not only my dreams, my future, my hope, my family. All these things, because you know what happens? I think that when people come to Christ or when they get encountered with the gospel, they think that I'm going to lose a lot. Surrender? That's not in my vocabulary. I'm not surrendering anything. I'm an American. I'm not an American. I'm not going to surrender anything. But when you take a look at the gospel, you don't lose anything when you surrender. You gain everything. 
Because he takes your wills, your passions, your dreams, your desires, your family, your hopes, your problems, everything, and he brings it in line with his will. When you step out boldly in his will, God will begin to move and shake things all around you. And the kingdom of darkness has to step back and be like, okay, now we got a problem here. Because this people, this family, this person is not behavior modifying. They're actually dedicating everything to this Jesus guy. And their life is dramatically changed, so much so that it causes a stir. Let's continue. And after he sent into Macedonia two of those who assisted him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while, and look what happens. About that time, a major disturbance occurred in regard to the way. The way is the reference that was the first name of Christianity. It's a way. It's a branch of Judaism. Sadducees, Pharisees, Herodians, all those other ones. The way was a sect of Judaism, and that's what they were known by. A major disturbance occurred in regard to the way because they saw the gospel lived out genuinely, authentically, and people were sharing Jesus with their friends, their family, their co-workers, whatever it was, that the whole city of Ephesus was being turned upside down. So much so that Pliny, a historian in the first century, recorded that Rome was in jeopardy of losing their footing, especially when it comes to uh, uh, the temple Artemis, in the gods because Christianity was converting people at a rapid rate until they put the smack down on them and all these things begin to adjust and Christians were being persecuted down the road. But if we're going to make a disturbance in the kingdom of darkness, you got to live genuinely and authentically because if you try to behave, you modify and go against the devil like we saw a week or two ago with the seven sons of Siva, the Jewish priest in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I rebuke you. And the demon's like, I know of Jesus and I know of this guy, Paul, but who are you? And then that demon jumps on them and strips them butt naked and they run running because they had no power. They had no authority. Why? Because they didn't know Jesus personally. But when you know Jesus personally, he will fight on behalf of you. He will shake the kingdom of darkness and he will set you free from the sins that you are struggling with. The temptation that happens is that we tend to put those chains back on because it's familiar. And we get comfortable. But you got to surrender everything. At this point, notice what he's doing. Paul's slowing down. He's investing in at least two people at this point. Erastus is mentioned in the book of Romans, chapter 16. He's also mentioned in 2 Timothy. Could be the same Erastus from what we gather. Timothy, obviously, he has two letters written after him. Personal correspondence. Paul is mentoring and pouring into people to help them take their next step with Jesus. And then notice what he's doing. He's letting them go. There's a stirring that's going on. He says, I think y'all need to be in Macedonia. And Paul doesn't hold on to them. A healthy church is a sending church. When people start walking with Jesus, they get a stirring in their heart. I don't know, I want to try to volunteer with kids ministry, youth ministry, young adult ministry, food bank, homeless ministry, you name it. Maybe God's calling me to missions. Maybe God is calling me for something else. Maybe I'm I'm a pastor. Maybe I'm a deacon. Maybe I'm an elder. Uh, We're going to come alongside you and pour into you to send you out. Because that's what a healthy church does. An unhealthy church hoards people. They sabotage dreams. I don't want to be that church. I hope y'all don't want to be that church. We want to see where is God stirring in your heart? What is he doing? Can we come alongside you? Can we, can we have this come about to see what is once maybe not a reality yet becomes a reality because we want to send you. Why? So that you can live out the calling of God. Now that might be a missionary as Jenny Potts gave us earlier uh, at the beginning of the service. Annie Armstrong. It's North American missions that we support. We support missionaries as a Southern Baptist uh, organization, and we send them out fully funded. They don't go out partially funded. We have to get pulled from the mission field only to try to fundraise everywhere they go. When we send missionaries out, they're 100% funded so that they stay on the field, so that they can build relationships in the gospel. Then at Christmas time, we have what's called Lottie Moon. That's international missions. All the money you give, 100% goes to international missions. But here's what I pray. One, that God raises up missionaries. That would be phenomenal if this church will send missionaries. But I also pray that God raises up workplace missionaries. In other words, you're walking with Jesus and where you are at is exactly where you need to be because that's your mission field. 
So in other words, God may call you to Africa, to the Philippines or whatever it is. But if not, our goal is to be in a 10 foot radius all around us saying, this is my mission field. Whoever comes in contact with me, I want to share the name of Jesus with them. If God would raise up, stir within our hearts, like, you know what? I think that's me. I can start by sharing my testimony or sharing something along that line. And look, at if you're working and the job says, I don't want you talking about religion, don't want you talking about politics, those are two are going to get you fired, and you agree to that, be a man and be a woman of your word. Honor that, unless you're independently wealthy and you don't need financial assistance. But I can tell you this, when you clock out for lunch, you can talk about whatever you want to talk about. And if somebody is saying, hey, you know what, I'm really going through a hard time, but I'm seeing your life and you're telling me who you once were and how you are. And I've been trying everything, drugs, sex, pornography, all this other stuff. And I'm not finding a solution in that. Say, hey, can I share with you my testimony on what Jesus did for me? Yeah. Hey, do you want to meet for coffee afterwards? Starbucks in the morning, whatever it is. There's a lot of places you can share the gospel. But are we doing that? Are we taking advantage of that? Paul is going to invest in these two, train them up, call them up into character to send them out. And not only when he does that, all of a sudden there's a disruption of the way because they're living out their faith. See, behavior modification is going to change only one of two things. Behavior modification is going to change the direction of your mouth, but your feet are not going to line up. A born-again relationship with Jesus changes the direction of your mouth and your feet where what we say and what we do lines up. Behavior modification won't, only a relationship with Jesus. So do your feet point the direction of your mouth? If not, why not? If we claim to be born-again believers, we have got to be challenged. We come to church on Sundays to be equipped, to be encouraged, so you can do the ministry Monday through Saturday in your family, in your friends, in your loved ones, in the workplace, workplace ministry. And sometimes the battleground is going to be in your home more than anything. Man, it's going to be in your home. But you know what? The Lord is faithful. The Lord will give us the strength, the perseverance, the resolve to continue to walk in his ways. So this disturbance is happening, and this dude, Demetrius, comes along board. Notice this guy. In the next several verses, I'm going to give you the list of how he's introduced. He's a silversmith who makes shrines, which means he's an entrepreneur. He brings considerable bank into this temple. He knows other workers in his guild. In verse 25, he mentions prosperity over his faith. He exaggerates Paul's message with an emotional cord. He protects the lie of an idol to protect his financial standing. He's in fear of losing his trade. And then the last thing that he mentions, by the way, Artemis, our goddess, is going to be in jeopardy of everything. That's the last thing. He follows the dollar. He doesn't follow doctrine. He's concerned about money is what he's concerned about. Let's read how he's introduced. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing considerable business to the craftsmen. He gathered these men together with the workmen of similar trades and said, men, you know that our prosperity depends on this business. Artemis is the Greek god that later on, Rome, when they conquered Greece, they renamed her Diana. So if you're reading from the KJV, you're going to see Diana, 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 instead of Artemis. Not only does Rome just say, hey, we conquered you guys. You guys got all these statues. Uh, We're going to rename your God. Zeus is now called Jupiter. Aphrodite is called Venus. Ares is called Mars. Artemis is called Diana. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Rome doesn't want to disrupt much. They're going to protect. But this goddess, Artemis, Wow. She is the eighth wonder of the world, her temple. It's a bank. A lot of money flows through this temple. They own 70,000 acres of agriculture, and there's 30 shrines littered throughout the Roman Empire. She is by far the largest patron deity in Rome. And a small group of Christians are disrupting Ephesus because their lives are changed. So Demetrius is like, We're going to lose our business. We're going to lose our business and we're going to get out of business. But do you find yourself doing the same thing? When the gospel confronts you, hey, you you need to make a change in your life. What am I going to lose? Man, I don't know. Because if I do this, 
Am I going to be able to watch football? Does God not want me to watch football? Am I going to lose all these things that I like to do? No, as long as they're not unbiblical. You can, do, you can pursue martial arts, football, career, all these things as long as they're not unbiblical. But when Jesus comes into your life, he's going to change everything. He's going to take your will, your dreams, your hopes, your desires, and he's going to bring them in alignment with God's will, the Father's will. And when that happens and you surrender to that, you're going to be a force to be reckoned with because you're not moving in two directions. You're moving in one. And you surrender everything. Demetrius has the opportunity here. He's seeing people's lives changed. He's hearing it. He's seeing it. He calls his guild together. He goes, we got to have a meeting. Here's what's happening. Why didn't Demetrius say, you know what? Is this true? These lives being changed. Am I believing the wrong thing? You know, if my finances are being turned upside down, can I pause to say in my line, word, uh, Lord, what are you doing? If I'm believing something heretical, I'm off in my own land, building my own kingdom, and God causes it to crash down. And if I'm searching for truth and I'm searching for meaning, would I not pause to say, wait a minute here. Am I pursuing the right thing? What's going on? I had everything. Now I have nothing. What's going on? Slow down. Demetrius has the opportunity to slow down, and he doesn't. He panics. He goes into survival mode. He begins to propagate a lie because Jesus is not at the center of Demetrius' life. When we are not Christ-centered, we're going to be other things-centered. And that other thing is going to drive you further and further away from Jesus. Because you're going to do whatever you can to protect that thing. Culture, identity, money, power, position, popularity, you name it. You're going to do whatever you can to protect that. And you're going to continue to further this lie. Demetrius has the opportunity to use his money to build the kingdom, but he doesn't. He builds his own kingdom. He's in a position of power. He's very influential, as we are going to continue to read. And he uses that influence to further discourage other people away from Christ. He has all this opportunity like everybody else does. You get confronted with the gospel, and you can step back and pause and reset to say, is this true? Man, let me adjust some things in my life. Or, I see it, I hear it, the answer is no, because I'm going to continue to build my own kingdom. And I'm going to do it at whatever it takes. And you will not care about the bodies or the broken relationships that you leave behind. It's usually until you get older that you slow down. God has a way with age. <laughs> you slow down. And you know what? I've been thinking I've been climbing the wrong ladder for a long time. I pray and I hope that that's you today. And you're, you're in two worlds. You're like, ah, I believe in Jesus, but I've not surrendered to him. Man, you need to get that right. Because if not, you're going to be climbing the wrong ladder. The ladder of corporate, the ladder of money, the ladder of power, the ladder of whatever it is. Only to find out when you get to the top, it's very lonely. And you realize all this time that you've wasted. But here's the good news. Jesus extends the invitation for you to make the decision today to follow him. Because he changes lives today. And when we surrender to that, man... We are a force to be reckoned with. Let's continue. You see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people saying that gods made by hands are not gods at all. Here's the interesting part. What he's saying is halfway true. Because yes, Paul is persuading a lot of people. The other aspect is he's using hyperbole because he's stoking the emotional cord with people so they get emotionally riled up, and we're going to see they're shouting, they're yelling. They become a violent mob because their emotions take over. So what he says is one part true. Paul is engaged in conversations, and this word for persuasion means he has an intentionality to bring you over to the kingdom of light, away from the kingdom of darkness. So that's true. How many of us, when we discuss with people, when we talk with them, do we slow down enough to have an intentional conversation to win them over to the kingdom of light? Persuasion is including dialogue, not monologue. I'm monologuing up here. I got a captive audience. That's preaching. 
Persuasion is a dialogue. You and me conversing one-on-one. What are your objections? Why do you not believe? What's going on? What happened to you when you were younger? Whatever it is, Paul is dialoguing with people, presenting the facts, presenting all the evidence, but more so he's introducing them to the resurrected living Lord. And the resurrected living Jesus is coming into people's lives and radically changing them. I can give you all the facts you want from textual criticism to the Greek manuscripts, all the fun stuff that's out there the secular uh, literary scholars go against. I love that stuff. I love reading it. It's, to me, it's totally exciting. I'm one of the few. But facts alone are not going to win you over into the kingdom of Jesus. It's when a person surrenders their will, their life, and their heart completely. That's what brings people into the kingdom of Jesus. It's not information. You can give tons and tons of information, and the person may still pose another question because salvation is not information-driven. It's experienced through a personal relationship with Jesus. One is head, the other one is heart. Paul is introducing Jesus to people, and people are inviting them into their hearts. Ephesians, does Christ reign in your heart? Because that's what changes everything. And these people are just freaking out at this point. But we can learn a lesson from Paul. Man, I want to be able to have a conversation with people and be intentional about introducing Jesus. Because it doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. You don't just stumble upon Jesus in a conversation. You got to find a bridge. You got to find a commonality. But be patient with yourself because sometimes that bridge that the person gives you doesn't come within the first conversation. It might come in the third month, sixth month. But if you're truly concerned about that person, not a project to be fixed, but you're concerned about that person, you will love them for who they are, where they are. But you will introduce Jesus because he wants to take them much more than where they're at. Remember, Jesus accepts people where they are at but he doesn't approve of your sin or my sin. But he doesn't also leave you there. He'll meet you there, but he'll invite you to say, come follow me, take up your cross. Take up your cross and follow me. Because I've come to give you life in overflowing abundance if you would just humble yourself and surrender. Man, that's the message Paul is sharing. It's not the facts. It's a relationship. Remember, Religion doesn't get you into heaven. There's a lot of religious people going to hell. A personal relationship with Jesus is the only thing that gets you into heaven. And that is something that you have to decide. The top concern of Demetrius that we're seeing as it unfolds is money. It's security. He gets confronted with the gospel and he's like, "Mm, not if you're going to be taking away all my stuff. Mm Mm-mm. I'm going to protect it. So he further propagates a lie in order to benefit his pockets. We need to be careful. Not only is there danger of this trade will fall into disrepute, but that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be regarded as worthless and that she's going to be dethroned from all her magnificence. It's all prosperity, prosperity, money, 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 money. By the way, we got to protect our goddess. It's like, well, that's kind of interesting because that wasn't the first thing that came out of your mouth. But you know what? We, if we're not careful, as I mentioned, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to look at all the things that we're going to try to protect. And we're going to dismiss or ignore the gospel. Because here's the beautiful thing about the gospel. Is that once you hear it, you can never unhear it. You are accountable to it. The gospel is you are dead in your sins. There's nothing that you can do. And in fact, there is something that you can do. You did it. You earned the penalty of judgment in hell. That's Ephesians chapter 2 and also in Ephesians 1. It's also in Romans. So God saw you in your brokenness and he met you where you were at. And he came down to live the life that you couldn't live perfectly, to become the sacrifice that you could never be, to pay a debt that's on an eternal level, not on a monetary level. And then he extends the invitation for you to repent of your sins, believe in his message. Jesus died for your sins and rose again the third day. And if you repent and believe in that, you will be saved. It's a genuine cry. It's not a a, a silver bullet prayer. It's, 
It's you coming to the Lord to say, I know I'm a sinner. I acknowledge that. Jesus, I need you to save me because I'm living a destructive life and I'm going down the wrong path. I believe that you died for my sins. You rose again the third day and I place my trust, my faith in you today. I am a follower of yours. Bible says when you call upon the name of Jesus, you will be saved. That's genuine. Or you can go through, through the religious lingo and say everything, but if you don't surrender everything to Jesus, then he's nothing. Remember, Jesus cannot be your Savior without being your Lord. You cannot get your get out of hell free card to be like, yeah, I believe that. I don't want to go to hell. Jesus, I believe you're a Savior. Then let Jesus control all of your life. Not so much there. A little bit. He can control a little bit that he's nothing at all. He is both Lord and Savior or he's nothing. We create in our culture this imaginary Jesus that can only be your Savior, but your life doesn't reflect anything. But the biblical Jesus is Lord and Savior because you can't have one without the other. And if you try to have one without the other, you're in two different worlds and you're being ripped apart. And maybe today you need to make that decision to get it right. I need to come to Jesus authentically today. When they heard this, they were filled with rage and they began shouting, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And the city was filled with confusion. They rushed together in the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's Macedonian traveling companions. Notice what the enemy does. Hijacks your emotions. You start shouting a lie more than embracing the truth. And then you become violent. Confusion, chaos, anger, hatred, and dragging people are all patterns of the enemy. Instead of embracing the truth and saying, Lord, change me, they start shouting more and more the lie. Joseph Goebbels, he was the Nazi propagandist in Germany. It is him who is coined with the saying, if you repeat a lie long enough, it becomes the truth. The enemy loves to come around you and whisper that lie over and over. And over again, the lie that you can never be saved, the lie that no matter what you've done in the past, it's never going to be forgiven. All this stuff, and he dregs up all the stuff from the past to throw it in your faith, and he's just trying to get it as a chant in your brain. You're not worthy. You're not good enough. You're not going to be saved. Got all this other garbage that he brings because he knows psychologically that if we dwell upon something for a minimum of 63 days, you will create a habit. It's not 23 days to create a habit. Uh, Dr. Caroline uh, um, Leaf mentions it's 63 days for it to germinate, take root, and actually become something that impacts your living. 23 days, whoever made that up, she goes, it was written like in a Vanity Fair uh, magazine, and it wasn't even written by a psychologist. It was a guy that just kind of threw a number out there. So if you want to start new patterns, it takes 63 days, nine weeks. Nine weeks. For you to say, you know what, I'm going to make a decision. Because the enemy has been pumping that lie in your ear, in your heart. And guess what also he uses? Social media, TikTok, news, people that know you, people that throw your past in your face. He uses all these levels of communication to inundate you with the lie and people stay in the lie. So you got to make a decision. Are you going to believe the lie? Or are you going to choose to surrender to Christ and say today, I'm going to start some of this. I want to wake up every day and say, Jesus, where are you working at? Because I want to be where you're at. Today, I surrender my will. Make a notation. Write it on your bathroom mirror. Put it on a three-by-five card if you're old school. Or guess what? If you're new school, put a reminder in your phone, an alarm that goes off at 1147, some odd, crazy time that says, surrender to the will of God today. And it goes on every day, every week to remind you, oh, yeah, I got to make that decision. Because guess what? We get inundated about making our own decision and not giving it over to God. See, sin is always looking for a target. That's why they grabbed these two companions of Paul. Why? Because they were once in the darkness, and now they're in the light. So they can't find Paul, so they grab these two guys, drag them to a 20,000-seated theater, drag them in there, and because they are emotionally upset. You see, sin gives you temporary satisfaction, but that temporary satisfaction leads to destruction emotionally, physically, and spiritually, and it leads to shame. But the gospel leads to forgiveness, which gives you a new life, which is salvation, and it's eternal. 
See, you got to surrender your will to the enemy or to Christ. You're going to surrender them to one or the other, and your life will reflect it. But here's my question. Are you surrendering over to Jesus every day? It's not a formula. Every day you wake up, and you're going to take a step in one or two directions. The day I'm going to wake up, I'm going to take a step closer to Jesus, surrender my will, or I'm going to back up, and I'm going to take a step closer to the enemy in the sin that I struggle with but you can't move in two directions at once. you got to consciously be aware what decision am I making because the enemy wants you to take a step closer to him. And there's no list of traps he has for you. So let's wrap this up. I don't have Lexi come on back if you want to uh, sing a final song. So here's my challenge. Number one, surrender to the, spirit, uh, to the Spirit in all areas of your life. Be resolved to be in the Spirit in all areas. Not See, if your life is like a home, a house, don't just invite Jesus into the living room, but you don't give him access to all the bedrooms and the closets and the secret rooms and the basement and the attic. All, he needs access to everything if you want your life to be changed. Sometimes we just invite him to sit down because the living room is the most picked up, but we got garbage going on. In the back, surrender all areas to him. And do not believe this lie Well, I got to wait till I get my life cleaned up before I come to Jesus. That's a lie from the enemy from the pit of hell. The whole point, the reason why you're broken is because you can't get your life clean. But Jesus can. Jesus can. Surrender to the Spirit in all areas of your life. Number two, take time to pause and reflect. If there's stuff going on in your life that you're like, what just happened? Is Jesus doing something in your life to try to get your attention? Or... Maybe you've been playing with the sin that you open the door again and Jesus just flipped your life upside down because you got to get rid of this. Could be one or the other. But you won't know until you take time to pause and reflect. Lord, where are you moving? What's going on? Why is this happening? I don't think I'm doing anything sinful. Okay, then that means he's shaking you up for something else. He needs you to get moving in a direction. And that's when you call upon brothers and sisters in Christ to pour truth into you. To see, Lord, where you discern um, what's actually going on. We need it. And lastly here, be led by Scripture, not your emotions. Your emotions are here, there, everywhere. But the word of the Lord increased when Paul was in Ephesus. People came to hear the message of Paul, and they were believing in Scripture. That's what changed their life. It wasn't a sermon. Hopefully the pastor is preaching something biblical. And your Bibles are open, so you could be like, okay, let me line this up here. But it's not the pastor. It's not the spokesperson. We're just vessels. But guess what? 2 Corinthians 5, 21 and following, all y'all are vessels. If you are a Christ follower, we are called to the ministry of reconciliation, not just a select few. All of us are. But it starts with getting to know Jesus personally. So we're going to sing this final closing song. Hey, if you need prayer, come on up. I'd love to pray with you. If you want to know what it means to follow Jesus personally, not religiously, love to talk with you either during this song, after church service, but you come as the Holy Spirit genuinely leads you because that's your decision. Would you please stand? Song is I am free.
As we close in prayer, be encouraged. Look at this walk of being a Christ follower. It's a journey. You're going to have epic celebration moments and you're going to have epic failures. But at least we're moving in the right direction. That's what it is. My challenge for all of us, beginning tomorrow, wake up. Set your alarm however it is. Wake up and may the first thing as you say, Lord, thank you for waking me up. Number one, praise God. Number two, where are you at? And where do you, want me to, where, do you, where do you want me at today in your will? I want to surrender it to you. Make it something vocal that you tell yourself every morning. Lord, I want to surrender to you today. And just enjoy the adventure. Because before you know it, God will call you home. And I don't know about you, but I want to live a life that is on the right direction, in the right direction. I'm not perfect by any means, but I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I hope that's your heart. If you want to talk more about Jesus and what it means to follow him personally to make that decision, come and talk with me afterwards. I would love to discuss that with you. Let me close us in prayer and let us be encouraged as we leave. Please bow your heads with me. Father God, we come to you and we want to live boldly as lions. The enemy wants us to cower in fear behind our struggles, behind our shame, behind our failures, behind what ifs. We can what if ourselves to death. But Lord, would you pierce through the darkness? Would you cause your word to grow in us that we would come to that point and pick up our cross and follow you daily? there's anybody here that does not know you personally, Jesus, I pray you wreck their heart. I pray you break it. That for the first time in a long time, they see clearly the fork in the road and the decision that has to be made. So Lord, I pray that you would move mightily within them. For those of us that have been walking with you for some length of time, give us the humility, Jesus, that we're not done growing. We can surrender to you every day and make that conscious as you're moving around us. Help us to be sensitive, sensitize our spirit to your Holy Spirit, that we may be in your will in all that we do. Forgive us of our failings. Help us to stand boldly upon your word, not upon our emotions, because we want to follow you, Jesus. It's in your resurrected, powerful name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. Be the hands and feet and mouthpiece of Jesus everywhere you go. And we'll see you next week.